Hollywood is a town notorious for long affairs and short marriages. But there was one marriage that proved an exception to this rule, one of the most enduring in the history of Tinseltown. Jimmy Stewart was nudging middle age when, in 1949, he married Gloria Hattrick. Jimmy and Gloria never looked back. And in their old age, Jimmy became not only a deeply loved star, but also a symbol of America itself. For over 40 years, Gloria was Jimmy Stewart's rudder, anchor, and helm. Jimmy Stewart was one of the most trusted of Hollywood legends, and in his veteran years, one who stirred great public affection. Well, I love her, Mr. Anderson. Do you like her? Well, I just said I did. No, no, you said you loved her. There's some difference between loving and liking her. Stewart was also a war hero, but one of affecting modesty. In the movies, his trademark gangling body and slow, exaggerated drawl reflected the qualities of honesty and thoughtfulness with which he was associated. It's always seemed to me that anything that has been lived is worth telling about without weaseling. Now, I'm Carbine Williams, and this is my story as I lived it. I'd only been married a short time when I left my job with a railroad gang and I started running a still. One day the federal agent swooped down on us. One was killed. Ah, oh, that man for himself! Late in life, Jimmy Stewart reflected on the essential elements of his style. I imagine that uh, sort of uh, an overall uh, look at it would be I'm, I'm the plodder. I'm the inarticulate man that tries, that I, I'm, I, I'm a pretty good example of true human frailty. I have very few of the answers, but for some reason, Somehow, I make it. I got you into this thing, and I'll get you out of it. Will you marry me, Tracy? Jimmy Stewart was born in Indiana, Pennsylvania in 1908. The town could have been the forerunner of Bedford Falls in It's a Wonderful Life. My father uh, had a hardware store in western Pennsylvania. The uh, windows of the hardware store were filled with stills from pictures I did. Uh, he, he, he liked that idea. The night I won the Academy Award, he called me and said, send the award uh, and I'll put it in the window. Jimmy followed his father to Princeton where he studied architecture and got bitten by the acting bug. Next stop was New York, where Stewart launched his career, learned the basics of his craft as a struggling young actor, famously played accordion to make ends meet, rubbed shoulders with the underworld, and made a lifelong friend of another struggling young actor. In the mid-30s, Stewart followed his buddy Henry Fonda to California to conquer Hollywood. Hollywood had become a factory town whose product was dreams for sale. Stewart slotted happily into the studio system, which he recalled with affection to the end of his days. He signed with the biggest and glossiest of them all, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. MGM's boss was Louis B. Mayer, an immigrant and former junk dealer who was such a super patriot that he changed his birthday to the 4th of July. 
Mayor placed Stewart on the studio treadmill, but MGM was at first unsure of what to do with their tall, skinny young property. It was decided, unsuccessfully, to pump up Jimmy's physique with a regime of weight training. One day, when I'd gotten to lift really heavy weights, really heavy, and I'd gotten very good, I, I finally put it down. I said, I can't do this anymore. I thought, this is a mechanical thing. There's something wrong. I, I can't do this anymore. And in three weeks, I was back to 130 pounds, and I, and I had to get a new shirt and a shirt. And I had to change the whole thing. So uh, the, uh, th th that idea of uh, sort of uh, changing my uh, bill didn't, didn't work. MGM also tried Stewart out as a heavy in an early outing in Rosemary, which proved no more successful than the dumbbells. But Jimmy made his way, loaned out to Universal to co-star in Next Time We Love with Margaret Sullivan, who had been briefly married to Henry Fonda and was another lifelong friend. In the musical Born to Dance, Stewart romanced hoofer Eleanor Powell and treated audiences to his trademark draw. It's been a lovely evening. You know, I'm beginning to change my mind about the sailors. Well, I'm a little shy. That's what I like about you. What's this all about? Uh, well, boy meets girl. Oh, I see. Well, boy loses girl. Boy gets girl. <laughs> Not so soon, sailor. Jimmy was reunited with Margaret Sullivan in Shop Worn Angel. He was cast as a young soldier from Texas, passing through New York on his way to the trenches in France in 1917. Sullivan played the lady of the title, a cabaret singer whom cowpoke Jimmy meets in the Big Apple. Just pretend, Bill, you're good at that. Dreaming's all right if that's all you got, but when you find the real thing, you're just, just not satisfied with it anymore. I want the real thing. No one ever doubted that Ginger Rogers was the real thing, and she co-starred with Stewart in the romantic comedy Vivacious Lady. Ginger was a rootin' tootin' nightclub chantoozy. Stewart was the college boy who falls for her. Well, it took a day to happen, but I'm in love with you for always. Then Stewart found a classic vehicle as the crusading country boy Jefferson Smith cast among the political sharks in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Stewart triumphed, somewhat implausibly perhaps, as an honest hero in a heartless world. Then in the comedy western Destry Rides Again, Jimmy tangled with feisty Marlena Dietrich. Off the set, he had a passionate affair with his co-star. In 1940, Ernst Lubitsch's charming romance, The Shop Around the Corner, teamed Stewart once again with Margaret Sullivan. And in the same year, they co-starred in The Mortal Storm, an early Hollywood broadside against the evils of Nazi Germany. The movie examined a German family torn apart by the Third Reich, but its roster of familiar stars and their American accents undermined its impact. May our happiness last as long as we live. Nonetheless, it was an early shot in Hollywood's propaganda war. It was also the last movie which Jimmy Stewart was to make with Margaret Sullivan. Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant were Jimmy's co-stars in the Philadelphia story. The movie, directed by George Cukor, was one of the high points of what became known as screwball comedy. What is this, Connor? Oh, easy, easy, old man. He's not hurt? No, no. Not wounded, so but... Uh... Seems the minute she hit the water, the wine hit her. Now look here, Connor. A likely story, Connor. Hello, Dexter. Hello, George. Hello, Mike. <laughs> Jimmy won the Best Actor Oscar for his performance. Old Flame Rogers won Best Actress for the title role in Kitty Foyle. 
By now, Jimmy Stewart enjoyed quite a reputation as one of Hollywood's most ardent ladies' men. Among his conquests were Loretta Young, Queen of the MGM lot, Norma Shearer, and Olivia de Havilland. But Jimmy and housemate Hank Fonda had different designs on their neighbor, Greta Garbo. She had a big, tall, nine-foot fence around her house, and we, uh, we came to uh, not think kindly of the fence. We didn't think she should have the fence around her. And so one night, over drinks, over drinks, we, we, uh, <laughs> we decided to uh, dig the tunnel and uh, go under and then come up in, on the inside of the fence and tell her that we didn't like to, her to have a fence. <laughs> but it, uh, it bogged down. We ran into sobered pipes and, 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 and we sobered up. And, and, and <laughs> Soon, however, Jimmy Stewart would be facing tougher challenges than Greta Garbo's fence. In the summer of 1940, the German army had conquered France and marched into Paris. Now it was London's turn. Throughout the autumn and winter of 1940, the Blitz raged over the British capital. Months before America was drawn into the Second World War, Jimmy Stewart had joined the United States Army Air Force. In the 30s, he'd been a keen amateur pilot. But Jimmy nearly didn't make it into the army. Yeah, I was turned down at first because I, you know, the army always has charts. Yeah. If you're so tall, you're right. supposed to weigh. Right. Well, I didn't weigh enough for that. Uh, but I, I just, uh, I guess, I sort of bribed them. I just said, "Don't look at the chart." So I, I, uh, I didn't step on the scale, and uh, I didn't for the rest of my army career. And it was a distinguished service career. In November 1943, Captain James Stewart arrived with the crew of his Liberator bomber to join the flying fortresses of the U.S. 8th Air Force in the strategic bombing campaign against Germany and occupied Europe. Okay, here they are. Nine o'clock high, enemy fighters. Stewart flew over 20 combat missions. With characteristic modesty, he rarely talked about his war, although he admitted to the very real fear he and his comrades felt in the skies over Germany. Stuart ended the war a much decorated staff officer with the rank of colonel. After the war, he served with the Air Force Reserve until 1969, retiring with the rank of brigadier general. By the time Jimmy returned stateside, the celebrations for the victory in the Far East were in full swing. In the years of war, America and Hollywood had changed. Things still looked reassuringly familiar in Indiana, but Stewart had decided to leave the comfort zone of MGM to follow a freelance career. He resumed his partnership with Frank Capra to make It's a Wonderful Life, a fantasy of small-town America. Don't you ever get tired of just reading about things? Yeah. Hey, what are you doing tonight? I don't want to get married to anybody, you understand? I want to do what I want to do. But the movie didn't chime with the mood of post-war America. Its time and position in the Stuart canon would come many years later. Magic Town struck a similar chord with Stuart cast as a pollster who stumbles on the perfect American community. I, I've been searching for a town like this for years. I too want to become a part of it. Please don't change it. Couldn't stand any changes. Could you? 
by all means hold back progress. Mr. Smith has to make an extra dollar for himself. I certainly think that's stooping very low. With his career faltering, Jimmy Stewart found a new direction in his personal life in the elegant form of Gloria Hattrick. Jimmy wooed Gloria, the former model and divorcee, in his favorite Hollywood restaurant, Chasen's. Jimmy always claimed that Dave Chasen was the only man in Hollywood his father had ever liked. Jimmy and Gloria were married in August 1949. The guest list at the wedding was a list of Hollywood royalty. Sadly, their honeymoon was interrupted by the death of Gloria's father. When they resumed it in Honolulu, Jimmy and Gloria were faced with another human tragedy, which called forth all of Jimmy's natural warmth. Also on the island were Jimmy's old friends, actress Helen Hayes and writer Charles McCarthy. They were consumed by grief at the death of their daughter from polio. Hayes later recalled, Jimmy and Gloria took us in tow and brought us back to life. For Jimmy and Gloria, the honeymoon in Honolulu marked the start of 45 years together. Gloria was a sophisticated, willowy brunette with flashing green eyes. She was very much her own person. A friend observed, nobody had a greater sense of self and nobody appreciated it more or depended on it more than Jimmy. Gloria had absolutely no movie ambitions, and in 1951, she bore Jimmy twin girls, Kelly and Judy. In the Stewart family, Kelly and Judy joined Gloria's two boys by her first marriage, Ronald and Michael. Jimmy was a model father to all four children. Meanwhile, his movie career was taking a new turn. His fallow years had been characterized by anodyne movies like the quiz show comedy, The Jackpot. I think it's Harry Jane. Will you repeat that, Mr. Lawrence? It's Harry Jane. Harry James? That is absolutely correct, Mr. Lawrence. Oh. But at Universal, with director Anthony Mann, Stewart was to make a memorable string of westerns which reshaped his screen persona. These hunted, haunted men, often driven almost beyond reason, played on the dark side of Stuart's character. Starting with The Man from Laramie, Stuart cast aside his open, guileless image to reveal a more complex, even bitter man underneath. I'll be seeing you, Glenn. You'll be seeing me. Every time you bet down for the night, you'll look back into the darkness and wonder if I'm there. And some night I will be. You'll be seeing me. Stewart's universal deal also gave him a share of the profits, a nail in the coffin of the studio system. Alfred Hitchcock, with whom Stewart had already worked on the 1948 Rope, seized on the tetchy new Stewart for Rear Window casting the star as a wheelchair-bound photographer who spends his time spying on the neighbors in his apartment block. The movie star as Voyeur. And through Stewart, the audience become Voyeurs too and witnesses to a possible murder. Four years later, in Vertigo, Hitchcock and Stewart produced a masterpiece of cinema. Stewart played a retired cop who suffers from the affliction of the title. Easy now. Oh no, oh no. Ah, well, it's a cinch. Yeah, I look up, I look down. I look up, I look... The vertigo is a metaphor for a deeper psychological disturbance agitated by Stewart's growing obsession with two women, both played by a hypertense Kim Novak, 
and his attempts to turn one of them into the other. Stewart's performance is startlingly raw, with all the barriers between actor and audience stripped away. It is a brilliant portrait of neurosis. If I let you change me, will that do it? If I do what you tell me, will you love me? Yes. Fine. Fine, then I'll do it. But as the 60s dawned, the landmarks in Stewart's life were slipping away. In 1960, his old MGM colleague Clark Gable and Margaret Sullivan died. Old friend Gary Cooper followed the next year. A deeply conservative man, Jimmy Stewart was happy to shake the hand of Spanish dictator General Franco. But he was at odds with opposition at home to the war in Vietnam. It was a war in which Jimmy lost his stepson Ronald, a Marine, who was one of over 50,000 US servicemen who died in the conflict doing their duty, as Stuart observed. Jimmy's movie career had been coasting for some time. But in the flight of the Phoenix, he was well used by director Robert Aldrich as an aging and harassed pilot, flailing around in a crisis when his plane comes down in the desert. happens again and I see who's doing it, I'll kill him. And there was a valedictory performance in The Shootist, an epitaph for the era of classic westerns starring John Wayne as a legendary gunfighter. And Jimmy Stewart in a cameo as the doctor who tells him that he has incurable cancer, an affliction from which Duke Wayne suffered in real life. Stewart himself suffered increasingly from deafness, but in the 70s turned to television taking time off from shooting at MGM to roam around the lot and revisit the hulks of sets which he remembered from the days before he went off to the war. Throughout their married life, Jimmy and Gloria had been tireless travelers. Gloria relished it. Jimmy mostly endured it for her sake. But as he grew older and more frail, Gloria, who was 10 years younger than Jimmy, found herself acting as both wife and sentry. Jimmy's withdrawal from the world was hastened by the death in 1982 of Henry Fonda, with whom he had co-starred 12 years earlier in the Cheyenne Social Club. But the honors continued to flow in. An honorary Oscar in 1985 and awards from the Cannes Film Festival, the Museum of the Modern Image and the American Film Institute. He received the Medal of Freedom and rekindling memories of Jefferson Smith's crusade, an award from the Boy Scouts of America. But in his old age, no honor could have pleased Jimmy Stewart more than the unveiling of a statue of himself in his beloved hometown of Indiana, Pennsylvania. The hardware store may be gone, but there is still a Stewart on Main Street and a museum to the memory of Indiana's favorite son. To the dismay of their friends and family, Gloria died before her husband. She succumbed to cancer in 1993. Jimmy died four years later in 1997. A friend recalled of Jimmy and Gloria's long, happy marriage I always thought there was more between them than love. There was also mutual respect and admiration. When you consider how hard it is to find admiration in married couples, that alone was probably what guaranteed the extraordinary length of their marriage.